Good afternoon from Vietnam, Ken. Thanks a lot for spending your morning joining our insight sharing and share your stories with our, our audience. And on behalf of the listeners around the world, we want to say thank you to you. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me. Hey, Ken, you had a chance to be in my country before, and you have the various chance to have business, uh, you know, doing with uh, companies in my country, even though it's yet, you know, create anything concrete, but I'm, I'm sure that there will be something in the future for, uh, you know, that's going to happen. So, uh, um, in our culture, you know it that it's going to be very honored for our audience if we can have you to do a little introduction about who you are and the works that you do. Can you please do that mm -hmm. for us? With pleasure. Let me first say that I'm sitting in Helsinki, Finland, which is my main home. Uh, I, but I grew up in the United States. I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. I went to Yale University and graduated with a degree in engineering and applied science, but I never actually practiced as an engineer. Uh, after graduating, I had the chance to study in Paris for a year, and that opened my eyes to a wider world. I had never been in Europe up until that point. but. Uh, when the funds ran out, I needed to go back to the U.S. and get a job. So uh, I ended up doing a very systematic search of what am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? What do I need to be happy? And I found through various contacts that um, there was an opening in corporate banking, which would allow me to use my mathematical skills, my analytical skills, and also my desire to work with people and travel. And I applied to several banks, and I was very fortunate that Citibank hired me into the executive development program. And I ended up staying with Citibank for 18 years. Uh, the first six in New York, I was a corporate banker, lending and money and working with companies that were in the fast food industry, the supermarket business, the discount store chains, the department store chains. I was on a steep learning curve, and it was great fun. But every year at my annual review, I would ask for a chance to go abroad. And finally, after six years, they sent me to London, where I worked in Citibank's European Training Center, where I taught other bankers risk management, negotiating skills, selling skills. And I learned that I love to teach, which was perhaps not so crazy because both my father and my sister were teachers, uh, which I had never really thought about as a profession for me. But after two years of doing that, I was asked if I wanted to go to a new frontier. And I said, Citibank's already in a hundred different countries. But the new frontier was Finland, where Citibank was given the first license to open up a foreign bank. So I moved to Finland and uh, was head of the corporate bank. And it turned out that Finns were very sophisticated in the financial world. And for four years, I uh, did some really great banking activities, project management, and several other things happened, including meeting my wife, who's a Finn, a Swedish-speaking Finn, which started my ties to the country. Uh, after four years, Citibank sent me to Istanbul, where I was lent to the Central Bank of Turkey, and my job was to take a dilapidated hotel on the Asian side of Istanbul on the Marmara Sea and turn it into a world-class training center. Mm. I had about a million dollars from the World Bank and other funds to do it. And we succeeded in creating a world-class residential training center for bankers called the Center for International Banking Studies. Uh, that got me known in the world of the World Bank and the IMF. So in, I did it for about two, two and a half years. But when I went for my next assignment, I ended up joining a group in Citibank that was doing consulting for other banks. It was called the Financial Institutions Consulting Group. And I moved the family to Brussels to open up a European office. There were already offices in Manila, in Colombia, in New York, and a few other locations. And a couple of things happened. First was that I was asked by the UN Development Program to assist the People's Bank of China in establishing their first training center for bankers. So in 1980, 1988, 
I found myself in Beijing uh, advising the People's Bank of China. And then I was hired by the National Bank in Hungary, and I had a huge project in Hungary. And this is even before the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, and I was in Hungary the day the wall, the wall fell. And I was doing other consulting assignments in Turkey and Greece and Portugal. And I did that for several years, uh, traveling a lot, which uh, the family felt was a bit burdensome. So after three years, I took another assignment in a place called Jersey in the Channel Islands, which is just off France, which uh, generally was a place where corporates were very active using its tax advantageous regime. Mm. But I wasn't there for more than a year because I was then headhunted by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Now that bank was started in 1991, created by governments from around the world to assist the countries of former Soviet Union in Central Europe, moving from communist countries to market economies. And I headed up a, a group that uh, was building banking schools. We built some business schools in Russia, Uzbekistan, Poland, Albania, all over. Um, and we did some training as well. Uh, did that for about four years until the present, new president of the bank decided he wanted to change the bank strategy. And it was suggested to me that my department which was basically run by funding from other countries. I was going out and begging for money. Uh, so I, I outsourced the team. Oh. And that got me into the consulting business. Uh, and in the, with that, my wife and I decided to move back to Finland from London, where that bank was located. And uh, I've been in Helsinki ever since. And in the last 25 years or more, I've been doing consulting assignments of all kinds and shapes. I've been doing um, training and development, leadership development, uh, using all types of methodologies from computer-based simulations to action learning. I work with large companies like Ford Motor Company for three years doing action learning and small companies as well. Uh, and during that time, I've had a chance to write three books, which perhaps we can talk about a bit more, but I been talking quite a bit so let me stop for a second you can ask a question from here absolutely absolutely Ken thanks a lot for for sharing the phenomenal career so let's travel time to understand because I from what I heard you study in engineering but your life you never work in the engineering world so we want to travel time to understanding why you get into the engineering world at the beginning okay uh, so when I was young, and I, want, I always wanted to become an astronaut, but life didn't give me any chance to do anything, you know, close to what I wanted to do. I want to ask, you know, when you were really, really young, what was your dream about the future, though, about your future? My real dream, as many young boys and girls, thankfully, uh, today, is, is to play professional sports. Ah. I wanted to be either a baseball player or a basketball player. Uh, I ended up excelling in, in football, soccer. And uh, I played in high school. I won many awards. We did very well. I played varsity soccer at Yale and again was honored with many distinctions during that time. Uh, I even still own an Ivy League record of most career saves by a goalkeeper in the Ivy League, uh, which also tells you a bit about the difficulties our offense had in scoring goals. <laughs> um, I, it's another long story, which I won't share now, but after I was working at Citibank, I was invited to try out for one of the professional soccer teams in the US. Uh, but I, after soul searching, I decided not to try for it and stay with my developing career in banking. Uh, engineering came about partly because I love numbers. I love an analytical ways of thinking. I'm a systematic thinker. Uh, my brother-in-law, his brother were, were engineers and I watched them and talked to them. And I actually enjoyed the studies that I did. 
Um, but I don't know that maybe that year abroad in, in Paris, when you're away from your comfort zone and your support network, gave me a chance to think quite a bit about whether this was the path I really wanted to take. Mm. Um, and that's when I came back to the States and I used a wonderful book that's still being published called What Color Is Your Parachute? Yeah. And I went through those exercises with the support of someone uh, helping me and, you know, who am I? What do I enjoy? What do I need to be happy? Mm. And I learned that I love people. I love numbers and analytics. But I also love people and I also love travel. And then I began to think being stuck in a lab doing research may not be where I was supposed to be. And that's how I ended up researching and working in banking. But I also had one piece of advice, which I would share with people, for young people in particular, who are looking to figure out what to do with their lives. It was recognized by the person who was advising me that I knew people whose parents were lawyers, doctors, engineers, in, in, in marketing and advertising. And she said, why don't you talk to your friends and ask if you can meet with their parents oh. and spend half hour. And I did that. I, I called up a friend and I said, your dad is a lawyer. Do you think he would spend a half hour with me to tell me what he does? Because when you're coming out of high school and university, you think, you know, but you really don't know what these professions are all about. Mm. So I would go to these people's office and I would say, you come into the office, you sit at your desk, what do you do? How do you spend your time? Are you reading? Are you writing? Are you traveling? Are you speaking with people? And that gave me a better insight. And that's what led me to banking, that it was a great chance to do the analytical work, but also travel and work with people. Mm, beautiful advice. Thanks a lot for, for sharing that. This is the first time ever I heard that advice. So talk to your friends and ask if you can have a 30 minutes with their parents and see what they do, right? That's the amazing advice, you know, advice from you. Thanks a lot. Ken, allow me to bring you back to the time that you were in Paris. Okay, so first time you went out of your uh, comfort zone and uh, you were in Yale back then, right? I had graduated from Yale, so this was an extra year that I arranged. Ah. Uh, I was actually in medical school in Paris. Ah. Um, I thought maybe being a doctor was interesting because um, I had worked, uh, when I was at Yale, one night a week, I volunteered at, at Yale New Haven Hospital in the emergency room. And they allowed me to not only move, move patients around, but take blood pressure and temperature. So I thought, gee, maybe I should explore um, medicine, but I was not able to apply and get accepted in the US. So I had a chance to study in medical school in Paris. Mm. Uh, I was able to get my French fluent uh, at that time. And uh, it was another impression on me about life and you know what was available. But I realized also at the end of that year that I didn't want to study for six or seven more years. I wanted to get out and do work and make some money. And <laughs> so that's why I didn't pursue the medical side either. That year in Paris has, changed, has a lot of impact in your life, though, because it's, it's also changing the trajectory of what you plan to do and, and, you know, put you into the different directions. So tell us, what was the findings that you had? back then, Ken? Well, you know, when you're out again outside of your cocoon mm. that you've grown up with for 18, 20 years, um, you're being influenced by another culture, another language. Uh, you, if you're open to it, you can't not help but be receptive to new ways of thinking mm. and new, new, new insights. Uh, you know, I've spent my whole career working in other countries. Uh, and it's been a great joy, uh, element of joy and excitement for me to learn about new cultures and understand new cultures. Uh, this was my first exposure to that, and it was explosive. Um, and I said, you know, I, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I do know I want to travel the world. I do know I want to meet people from other cultures. And so that was the major insight. Uh, I think, yeah. uh, 
as I said, I had to come back and figure out what to do with my life. But every uh, year at my performance review, I said, please send me back overseas. I want to explore the world. Wow. Was there anyone in your family or in, 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 your, in your network when you were young that had that influence inside of you? So one day you wanted to travel the world like that? Interestingly, no. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, I knew very few foreigners, as an American mm. typically doesn't. Uh, we had some exchange students in high school. And in fact, uh, I was asked to apply for exchange one year in high school. And uh, I was offered to move to spend a year in Greece or in Germany. Um, But I didn't go because, quite frankly, my career as a soccer player was advancing and school was working well. So I didn't want to spend an extra year out away and then come back and, and start that again. So maybe there was that seed in me about the chance to go overseas. But I cannot think of at the time anyone in my family uh, who lived abroad, moved abroad, traveled even much abroad uh, at that time. So. And, you know, at that time, you had a chance to travel to a different state uh, or, you know, a different city, right? But you decided to go to a different continent and go to uh, to Paris. It's a whole different, you know, the cultures, people, the language and everything different. What made you to decide and why Paris, though? <laughs> the Paris was just uh, something that fell into my lap with my parents. Someone was arranging this kind of study opportunity. So that was just chance and walking through an open door. Oh. But, um, and I already had studied French, uh, and I just needed to bring it up to a level where I could speak it and understand it uh, fluently. So that was perhaps another initiative. I didn't have to learn a new language, like going to Germany or somewhere else. <laughs> But uh, I can't, I can't explain it. It was just, it was presented And I grabbed it, and it changed my life. See, sometimes there's a destiny. You know, in our Eastern culture, we call it destiny, right? Something is meant for you. It's meant for you. So, I, you've been very successful in the banking career, and then you move into a consulting business, right? And then eventually, you, you said that you are, you are the author of three, uh, three books. So tell us, since when inside of you have the urge of writing and starting to write your first book, though? You know, in high school, I enjoyed writing and I wasn't very good. And my English teacher, who was also my advisor, if you will, worked with me after school to help hone my writing skills. And I needed that, of course, in university as well, because wonderful thing about U.S. universities is a liberal education. So even though I was taking courses to lead to the engineering degree, physics and all these types of maths and such, I was also taking other courses in English and art history and theater. And for those, you had to write. So I, I knew I enjoyed writing and I, and I wrote pretty well, although it wasn't you know, something I did full time. When I got into banking, I learned it was important to write well as well. As you're trying to write a proposal to lend money to a company, you needed to write succinctly, clearly, communicate very carefully the pros and cons. So writing became, and still is, an important element of most businesses where you're trying to, to have decisions made mm. about the pros and cons of a, a concept, an idea, a proposal. Um, when I got into the consulting business, I one of the things that I felt I needed was some credentials apart from my experience. And there's a program, which I'm not sure you're aware of, it's called Life Orientations or LIFO. Yeah. Um, it's a methodology to um, help people understand themselves and to work out strategies to improve their communication and make successful relationships with other people. Uh, I had been introduced to it because Citibank had introduced us to it. And I met one of the two founders, and I realized that there was only one book on the subject, and he had written by his partner. So he and I developed the idea to write a book. The whole concept of LIFO is built around your strengths. 
strength orientations and working with understanding how these orientations, how you behave, evolve, and how you change your behaviors under stress and how you need to understand what they are. That's number one. Number two, it's about reading other people. You know, the, the, the conventional golden rule, do unto others the way they want you want them to do unto you. In LIFO, we turned it around to do unto others the way they need and want to be done unto, meaning read other people, understand their orientations, mm. and change and develop your approach to them based on how they need to be communicated to. <clears throat> so we wrote the book, uh, Managing Your Strengths. It got one translation into Portuguese uh, in Brazil. Um, it, it was mainly a trade book for people who work with this LIFO method. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was a very great experience. So for me, it was the first chance to collaborate and write on a, write a book. And that said, I, I'd like to do more of this one day. <laughs> um, and that happened later on. Uh, after I did three years working with Ford, someone called me and asked me, since I know something about the motor industry, do I want to help build a course around Formula One racing for a large international law firm based in London. And to make the story short, I and two other gentlemen, a former commercial director for two of the Formula One teams and a professor of strategy at one of the business schools in the UK, and I devised a two-day course where I role played that I was the vice president of strategy for Volkswagen, mm. and we wanted to enter Formula One under the Audi brand. And then we would have the, these lawyers come in and say, you're not lawyers any longer, you're now consultants, and you have to advise me, do I buy a team, do I start a team, do I do an engine supply? And uh, we ran that course over three years 50 times wow. for thousands of their lawyers who flew in from all over the world to do it. And at the end, the two other colleagues of mine decided that we'd write this book. Uh, we would very excited that Cambridge University Press wanted to publish it. So we published the book in 2005, Performance at the Limit, Business Lessons from Formula One Racing. 2007, we made an eight part, or we helped make an, an eight part series with the BBC about the ideas in the book called uh, Formula for Success. And then the second edition we wrote 2009, and the third edition we wrote 2016. And it's out now in Mandarin Chinese, in Turkish, and in Japanese. And I do quite a bit of work uh, doing speaking engagements, uh, doing workshops with organizations, using the concepts from the book to talk about leadership, teamwork, innovation, and change, transformation, and those kinds of topics. Wow. all relevant to how a Formula One team works. Wow, and then we want that book to be translated and published in Vietnamese also, and so that it can be accessible to, to many, many in Vietnamese in this country also. So let's work on that one together, all right? <clears throat> well, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, let's work on that. And uh, the third book I published on my own was about a year and a half ago. And it came about because I'm very fortunate to be part of something called Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches. Mm. Uh, I was really pleased when Marshall included me in this group four years ago. And uh, just before COVID, a group of us in the European part of the group had met in London, and we decided to support each other by posting on LinkedIn stories, articles, ideas, concepts, promotion, and we would support each other by all posting at the same time within one hour on one day. Mm. Now, you might cynically say we were trying to game the algorithm to get more views, but in reality, that worked. Mm -hmm. But I came home and wasn't sure what to write about, and it was my daughter who said, you know, Dad, you're always telling stories. You've had so many experiences. Why don't you write these stories? So uh, I started to write them, and of course, at that time, LinkedIn had a character limit of 1,300 characters. So I very carefully created stories about my experiences around the world, and 
at the end of each story, I wrote a lesson, a business lesson or a life lesson. And they were very successful. Uh, and the group kept pushing me to actually write a book that included those stories. So finally, in July of 2021, I published a book called Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers, Adventures in Global Business. And there are 53 stories, all one page only. And at the end of each page is a lesson about life or about business that someone can take away. And uh, that's been great fun. And just last Thursday evening, I spoke to a book club about it. Um, they asked me to read some of the stories. And it's, it's always just you know great to share your experiences as we're doing that. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. Can you pick a story in that book and then share with us? I could. Uh, I could read it if you give me a chance. Or Please. I could, um, let, me, let me get the book. Um, I'll read one of, one of the stories that uh, probably has had the most uh, views, if I can find it. Yeah. I call the story, here's the book, by the way. And, the, and I was very fortunate to get um, Marshall Goldsmith to give me an endorsement. And uh, one of my colleagues has called me the Indiana Jones of cultural adventures, which I thought was great. So I, I used that on the back cover. <laughs> this story is called Serendipity. And it's, as you can see, it's not very long. One day I was walking to an important meeting near my home when it rained hard with strong, gusty winds. My umbrella was of no use, so my khaki trousers were soaked. I passed a second-hand clothing store. You probably know the kind. They have receptacles placed around the city for clothing donations. These items are sorted at a central facility and then distributed, in this case to one of their 12 stores around Helsinki. I entered the store and on a small rack found a pair of khaki trousers. The label indicated a waist size and length that I knew would fit. What luck! Without trying them on, I paid and ran to the meeting venue where, in the men's room, I put on the new trousers, and it was a good meeting. The rain had stopped when I walked home. Entering our home, my wife said, I thought you'd be more wet than this. So I proudly shared my good fortune at the clothing store. She asked how much I paid. I told her. She looked at me and burst out laughing. Do you realize that you just paid 13 euros for the trousers that you donated a month ago? I could not believe it. I slipped them off right there in our hall hallway for a closer inspection. Sure enough, it was true. And the lesson you make. Ken. Yeah, I lost you for a second. Yeah, I lost I you for about, I, need... I lost you for about fifteen seconds for some reason. Uh, you were talking about the, the lessons. Because so what was the lesson? Okay. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Um, can you see me? Because I can't see you now. I'm sorry. I, I can see you. I can see you. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll just I'll just go ahead. The lesson is you may not always end up where you thought you were going but you will always end up where you were meant to be. Wow. Apparently, the same is true for donated trousers. Oh. See, Ken, thanks uh, for sharing that. Earlier in our conversation, we also talked about that, right? So you all end up where you're meant to be. You ended up, you know, doing what you are meant to be doing. And that's how beautiful this, you know, like life is. Uh, and there's a there's a lot of things that we cannot explain by word, right? So <laughs> I truly believe in in what you call destiny earlier on mm. that um, life works out the way it should. Uh, we have choices, 
and sometimes you make the right choice and sometimes you make the not so right choice. Uh, it's never a bad choice. It's just the one that you made at that time, given the information you had. Mm. But um, it, it works. Uh, and uh, we end up where we are and we do the best we can. Mm. Since you mentioned about that, Ken, you've been traveling the world, you've been doing a lot of amazing works, right? And out there, a lot of people are making choice every day. So if there is any advice that you could give to us so that we can put into consideration each and every time we're making a choice, a decision on something, we can think of so that we make better choice that lead us to a better, better, you know, destiny and destination. So can you share? Well, I guess there are two things that come to mind. One is the old right side, left side of the brain, logic and creativity. And those people who succeed most are able to use both sides of their brain. Mm. It's not one or the other. And I've had to learn that over time, having grown up, as I talked earlier, about a very systematic way of thinking, uh, logical way of thinking. Uh, I've been able to enhance the other side of my way of thinking, because partly because my wife is an artist, and I've learned to appreciate art and theater over time. The other thing I would say is the importance of paying attention to your gut feeling. Mm. Um, and of course, this partly comes from life experience. Uh, and uh, while it's important to make decisions based on data, based on analytics, uh, it's also important to listen to what your gut, your heart is saying. Mm. Uh, in the book, I talk about one story when my wife and I were going to India. And um, we had bought the tickets, we had gotten the visa, and for some reason when I bought the tickets, I have never done this before or since, I bought cancellation insurance. Uh, about two weeks before the trip, I decided that we should not go, and that's something I would never ever do. Mm. But it turned out, if we had gone to Mumbai and New Delhi, it would have been up there at the time in Mumbai when they had the terrorist attacks. Oh. And we would have been in that hotel at that time. So, you know, life has these very, very funny serendipitous moments mm. when you get lucky, or maybe there's something else out there that's telling us, listen to your gut. Wow. What did your wife talk to you after that? you know, incident? Well, we, we, we both believe in, in life will turn out the way it's supposed to turn out. But interesting, what I wrote in the, the book, Exploding Turkeys, is my son was a fellow at Oxford University for a period of time, and we went to visit him, and he introduced us to a, um, a person in his program, and uh, he was a former CIA agent, and I for some reason, we got onto this story, and he told me, and he referred me to a book, um, the, the name I can't remember right now, uh, that, yes, in life, we often have these moments where, mysteriously, something tells us to do something or not do something, mm. and, and that's real. Uh, and it's very strange, but uh, my point clearly is, don't discard these thoughts, listen to them. Don't always follow them if you don't want to, but do listen to your, to your gut. Thanks a lot for sharing that. I, I think that a lot of us, you know, working on one part of the brain and we always use numbers and data to make a decisions and we listen to the facts and figures. But sometimes, you know, our gut's telling us things that beyond numbers, right, and beyond the figures and for some reason, and, and if, if we know how to leverage the, the, the voice from that, the, you know, the inner call, then it might lead, it, uh, lead us to something that we never know. It's just like you, you, you listen to your inner, uh, inner feeling and you went to Paris, right? And then the whole world changed ever since. <laughs> exactly. They were taking the job in Istanbul. Uh, I actually flew to Istanbul from Helsinki and turned down the job uh, for various reasons. And then the senior people in New York called me and said, please take another look, take your wife down. We visited the location where the school would take place 
in this dilapidated hotel, and there were sheep grazing in the lobby of the hotel. And I looked at my wife and I said, this is not going to be easy. And she said, one, this, you have one chance to do, make a real impact and do something terribly significant to help people, to educate people. Let's do it. So uh, you, you make choices. Mm. Um, you know, one other thought comes to mind with this banking crisis that has hit the U.S. and Switzerland recently. It's very easy to look at all the data the liquidity of a bank, the capital adequacy of the bank, and all these things, it's much harder to assess the management. And at the end of the day, all of these problems with companies and banks are generated from how the leaders performed or did not perform, mm -hmm. how they dealt with adversity and problem solved when things got bad. It's easy to lead and manage when uh, the going is good. So. You know, it, it's it's nothing you can put through a computer or AI to determine how good a manager or leader someone is. It's very, very qualitative and subjective. And that's just something, again, you have to decide from your yourself, not just your head, but your sense of that person. Mm. Ken, since you're an expert in performance, you wrote a book about that, right? Uh, and yes. creating a, a, a performing team or performing organization is hard already and sustaining the performance over time is extremely extremely hard and it's rare that we have companies that can do it you know so mm -hmm. can you share you know some advices for because a lot of my listeners are managers are, are, are business leaders and they want to you know like your wife say take the opportunity and make the best impact on or, or you know yeah. back then right so they also holding a position that can make impact and are creating you know something good for people right so how can they create and sustain a performance over time though I think first thing, a leader has to be clear on the purpose and the vision of the business. They really have to have a vision that inspires and motivates people, and they have to communicate that extremely well. It has to mean something to the organization and everyone in it. The second thing, they have to create the culture, mm. which is open, transparent, allow people to uh, to speak their mind and have views. We call it, of course, these days, psychological safety. But the importance of people having a chance to share what they're thinking, with, even if it's a negative or not so constructive thought, sometimes is useful and, and senior leaders need to listen. And uh, I guess the third thing is communication. Uh, you cannot take communication for granted, whether it's internally or externally. It's not something that just happens. Uh, I love this quote from this famous actor, Peter Ustinov. He said that communication is the art of being understood. And even if you've said something to someone, it doesn't mean that they understood it. And you have to make sure the message comes across. And this is particularly of concern and interest in a cross-cultural situation where language comes into being and and, and gestures and cultural norms are different. Uh, so that, you know, I spent a big part of my life, as I said, working with interpreters uh, and making sure they understand not just what I'm saying, but what I'm meaning mm. and get that message across to the audience who doesn't understand my language is, is crucial. Uh, communication, I talked about leaders being um, being you know the, the the key to any organization credibility of leaders you know you spend your whole life building trust by the your actions and your behaviors but it takes only one moment mm. to crush that reputation if you do something which is not appropriate so character uh culture of culture not only of not fear of speaking up but also of collaboration yeah no business gets things done by one person. We're collaborating all the time, internally and externally. And then lastly, I would say that it's important for leaders to understand that their job not only is to 
create change and direction, but to also teach. Mm. I think leaders are should always remember that they have experience, they have a view, a helicopter view, that others in the organization don't have, and they need to teach others along the way and not hold everything they know close to them. Communication, character, culture, and coaching. Wow. The four C's. Beautiful, the four C. Thanks a lot for sharing the four C, Ken. And I will have two last questions for our conversation today, all right? Uh, okay. So uh, during our conversation, you mentioned numerous times, a few times about the word thinking, all right? So you moved to Europe and your whole world changed and you think, uh, you know, your thinking also changed and you, you, you tell, you know, that uh, you told that uh, uh, we should, you know, ask our friends, parents so that, you know, uh, about their job so that we can get into their place and we can understand about change our thinking about the and you know the career professions whatever so you travel the world you work with a lot of amazing people you know do a lot of amazing things we want to understand the secrets of your thinking ken so can you teach us how have you been growing your thinking over the years um okay Let's see. I guess first uh, is open mind. Mm -hmm. uh, trying not, although it's hard sometimes, to be too judgmental, to give the benefit of the doubt before you make your decision or your judgment about something or someone. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone who can travel the world and see other cultures can enjoy it unless you have an open mind mm -hmm. and accept there are other ways of doing things even other ways of thinking mm -hmm. about time, for example, or about how you treat the elderly or, or whatever the topic might be. So open mind and not too judgmental. Uh, I think it's important to develop your skill of lateral thinking, mm -hmm. not to be funneled, have your thinking funneled into one direction, but to open your mind and look for relationships that might add to your understanding of the situation. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the third thing I would say is, uh, I'm a glass half full person. Mm -hmm. I usually try to see the positive in situations, the positive in people, until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I like to be very optimistic in uh, taking my approach to any business opportunity or any personal relationship until I'm shown that you know maybe I was wrong and or maybe I should adjust my thinking. There's a great quote that I've used in speeches before, and it's ascribed sometimes to Abraham Lincoln, but I'm not really sure. And he was asked, what's the difference between a pessimist and an optimist? And he said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, while an optimist sees the, the opportunity in every difficulty. Mm. And I guess I've developed a way of thinking very optimistically. Recently or ever since? Over time, over time, I, you know, moving to France, then moving to London, and then to, to um, Finland, and then especially the Turkey, which was quite a culture shock. Uh, you, learn, you have to learn to be more tolerant and open-minded. Uh, there are many different ways that things get done that are different mm. than the way you were growing up to think they get done. Mm. And uh, you can fight it, uh, which could be aggravation and anxiety and not lead to great well-being. Mm. Or you could learn to understand it. Not, I'm not saying you change your values about what's important in life but you learn to understand that maybe you need to take different pathways to get the same thing done beautiful. in a different culture, in a different environment. Beautiful, beautiful. The next question I have for you, Ken, is about happiness, all right? My wife and I, we, we on our second, you know, initiative to find answers to help people to get, to be happier in their life because we saw a lot of people are not happy 
like what they do and how they live and stuff like that and you you seems to me that you are really doing everything really really beautifully and you're really happy at what you do so if you rewind your life you know and then you can share with us a secret that can that contribute to your happiness what would be those things eh? uh you know uh, you're asking the right person because I'm sitting here in Helsinki and Finland was for the sixth year in a row named as the happiest country in the world I know. <laughs> uh, by the UN and the report that they write. And, you know, people in France are laughing about this and saying, you guys must be dancing in the streets. And it, it's, it's really not that. Uh, happiness for me, and maybe the reason why I feel such affinity to Finland, and you know, these days I'm both a US and a Finnish citizen, and I'm very pleased and proud about that. Um, it's, it's about being content. Mm. It's about understanding that it's not easy to find harmony between life, work life and personal life, but you can, and I'm, I'm, I don't use the word balance, because I'm not sure it's really a, a balance. It's a harmony mm. that you need to find. And in Finland, we've learned here to work hard, to produce well in the organizations that we work in. But we've also learned the importance of free time, vacation time, time with family, and not compromising on that. Yeah. And so if you ask me, my recipe, it's about making a choice to live a life that gives you that harmony between your family life, your friend's life, your life of hobbies, and the work life that you want to do. I've been fortunate to find a way to make that happen. And, uh, and I don't suspect that it's easy for everyone Again, depending on the culture that you're working and living in. But in Finland, we've been able to find that harmony between life and work. And uh, that's why I can smile and be happy. <laughs> so making a choice to create that harmonization, right? You can. Um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that everyone in the world can find this harmony. Uh, and there are different stages in your life as well. You know, I don't mean to think that you can do this all the time. There are stages when you're working nonstop, mm. but the body won't allow you to do that. And, you know, we're putting a great deal of focus on well-being these days. COVID kind of brought that to the fore mm. that um, even though you might be able to work at home, there are other issues that are to arise because you're isolated yeah. and you're not getting the support from your colleagues at the office. Uh, burnout is a big issue these days, so it's not a, and I don't mean to make it a simple choice, and I know it's difficult, but it's a conscious decision that someone needs to make about how they work, how they sleep, how they eat, how they exercise, and that holistic approach is what makes someone happy, that if you can find that harmony among all of those elements, family and friends, then you're a lucky person. And, and that's what I think most people should strive for if they can do that. Beautiful, beautiful. I told you earlier that I have two questions to end this conversation, but I, I just come up with another last one. Is that okay if I ask? Sure. All right. So we've been traveled time in the past already. We're now understanding what you are doing. Can I want to travel to the future? Is there anything that you are working on that exciting you want to share with me and the audience so that we can celebrate with you in advance? <laughs> well, you know, I made a conscious decision some years ago. And my wife gave me some great advice when we had our first grandchild. They now we have them between seven and 12 years old. When the first one was born, she said, um, you travel a lot, you enjoy what you do, but until a certain age, maybe 10, 11, 12, you are Superman to your grandchildren. Mm. After that, they, uh, they find their own lives, their friends, their hobbies, and their work and their school. Uh, so I adjusted my life to travel a little less 
and to spend more time with my four grandchildren, which I truly love. It's, it's great being a grandfather. Uh, having said that, I don't think I can retire and you know do the lawn or whatever people do when they retire. Uh, so I am traveling. Uh, I'll give you a, a view of the, some of the assignments I've done recently uh, in the last nine months. I advised a bank in Slovenia, making a couple of trips to Ljubljana to assist the leadership team in understanding a change and transformation which was taking place. I've spoken to a large uh, Swedish manufacturer of transportation equipment on their culture day to talk about organization culture. I advised the leadership team of a startup bank in Sudan, interestingly enough, although I didn't travel to Khartoum, I did that remotely. Uh, I gave a keynote speech in Salt Lake City, Utah, back about four or five weeks ago on business lessons from Formula One. Uh, and I'm looking to a few other assignments where I can travel, which as you can tell is what I enjoy doing. And using this body of work that I've developed, particularly with Formula One, but also in terms of leadership and culture, which I can share with organizations. So uh, the future holds some work and a balance with my family time, uh, which I can enjoy my grandchildren. Wow, and you will always be their superhero. So, <laughs> so next time travel with them, right? And then bring, you know, let them travel with their superheroes and they will be so delightful for that, you know? <laughs> it's, it's under discussion. Uh, I've always made a point with my two children to take them on trips with me to Dubai and, and uh, Vienna and other things I was doing. So the, the grandchildren are lining up. <laughs> and then bring them to Vietnam. It's going to be another like uh, Turkey years ago that you and your wife had that experience, right? So, but Vietnam now has changed a lot since the last time you came, so please bring them here. Right. Love to, we'd love to. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for this wonderful conversation. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and thanks so much for sharing all the beautiful advices and all the sharings with our audience. We learned a lot from this conversation. I wish you and your family all the best and I hope that one day either we can see you in in Finland or or you guys gonna travel to our country and we'll be so happy to take you you and your family around town. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words and the invitation to do this and uh, yes I look forward to seeing you and your wife here or in Finland or perhaps in uh, Vietnam. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Say hello to your family. Will do. Thank you. Bye-bye, Ken. Bye-bye.